Welcome to the Virtual Excellence Show, where we speak to amazing people to give us insights into how to do things well in a virtual world. And in a moment, we'll be speaking to the very interesting Phil Simon, who has a lot of insights to share, and we'll get to Phil in a moment. Just, just to tell you, this is uh, the Virtual Excellence Show. We uh, try to share insights, lessons learned, tutorials, and so on, so please do support us by liking the video if you like it and uh, subscribing to our YouTube channel. You also uh, go to our website, the vx.show, and you can also use our Twitter hashtag uh, at uh, hashvxshow. So Phil Simon is an uh, expert in many things, including uh, things virtual, as a speaker, has been a professor, authority on many things, has written 10 books, including the award-winning books, uh, Message Not Received, The Age of the Platform, and uh, most recently, Slack for Dummies and Zoom for Dummies. And while we're not all dummies, I'm sure we're all desperate to hear from Phil's insights. So, welcome to the show, Phil Simon. Ross, thanks for having me. Great pleasure to have you. So, I think there's a lot of uh, organizations and people who are trying to get their head around Zoom and Slack these days. And so, you're uh, the man who wrote the books, in fact. So, how is um, what, what's the demand you've seen? Are, are people able to work it out for themselves or do they need help from uh, experts like you? Yeah, if I had to guess, and I don't have any data on this, but just anecdotally, um, I think that Zoom is more intuitive for folks, at least the tip of the iceberg. Uh, I make the point in both books that Zoom is actually easier for people to wrap their head around because in an email, you really don't turn it into a video chat. Although with Gmail, as you probably know, now they're pushing Google Meet um, and it's almost intrusive. Um, Slack, on the other hand, in fact, um, a woman who reviewed the book on Amazon made this point, said, I really had a hard time getting my arms around it because Slack really requires you to speak a different language. You communicate in channels and, and Zoom has those too, uh, but people don't tend to use those from my experience, although they can. It's one of the reasons I wrote the book. Um, so Zoom is a different mindset for people. Um, I should say Slack is a different mindset for people. I think people understand the idea behind Zoom because they used Skype or FaceTime or something like that. But uh, in writing these books, I really wanted them to go beyond just using Zoom for video meetings and, and Slack as email 2.0. Both are much more robust communication tools. So... To that point, I mean, I think you have pretty people find it pretty easy to uh, get on a Zoom call. Though I think uh, people on Mac actually have harder times in my experience at times. Mm. But the that's when you start to do a event, for example, a panel event. We've got some somebody speaking, and then we've got some other people speaking, trying to manage that. And there's people making livelihoods from managing that because people think, oh yeah, we can do that. But it's actually a lot more hard work than oh, it sure. seems to go just beyond a simple, you know, let's have a call to trying to do a show or a program. And so there, what, what should people, I mean, is this something where we need a Zoom presentation manager as a dedicated job or can people learn to do this on the fly themselves? You can learn to use the tools by themselves, Ross, but Zoom offers far more robust video calling tools. In fact, Slack up until July of 2019, I believe, let you control someone else's screen. Right? They no longer let you do that. Slack, I believe, caps the number of concurrent users on a video call at 15, whereas with Zoom, it's much, much higher. Now, if you're doing a meeting with, holding a meeting with five or six people, well, much like in the real world, you wouldn't need someone to manage it. But if you were doing, and I work as a public speaker when people speak in public, well, it hasn't been the case for a while. You don't just show up at a conference, right? You need someone organizing it. You need someone working the AV. You want someone to introduce you. So with larger meetings or with Zoom webinars, I highly recommend to people that they have someone there who is working as the manager, administrator, whatever you want to call it. I've done plenty of webinars in my life and plenty on Zoom as of late. You can't possibly present the material, stay focused, handle 
attendees questions, answer them, move them into buckets. You just, there's no way you can multitask like that. So, and so fortunately with Zoom in the webinar chapter, I believe it's chapter eight of the book, I explain why in some cases a webinar makes sense. And it's primarily because you can allow people to do different things. A panelist typically isn't going to speak, but he or she may manage the polls or handle the questions. Now in both meetings and webinars, you can appoint a co-host in Zoom, but there are reasons that you want to do one or the other. So yeah, if you think you can handle it all yourself, it'd be like running a restaurant by yourself. There, there's no way you're going to be cooking and taking orders. Yes, uh, I think that's a, a very uh, worthwhile reality check for people. So so this is all part of there's a, these, uh, this wonderful acronym we all know, WFH, Working From Home. So a lot of organizations have already been there, actually, for a long time, and uh, they're coping quite well with uh, our unusual circumstances in 2020. Other organizations are um, totally new to this. So do they just need Zoom and Slack, set them up and roll it away? Or what does an organization do to shift to a working from home environment to, to make this productive and work for people? Okay. So the tools certainly help. There's no way that you can collaborate with email in the same way that you can with Zoom and Slack and Microsoft Teams. This, you can't use email to manage projects. You'd want to use Basecamp or Asana or any number of different tools. So uh, my book, Message Not Received, that you mentioned earlier, is in large part a diatribe against jargon and email. So the tools certainly help, but there's a shift in mindset, right? When you're working from home, Right. Your boss is probably not going to install a camera inside your home the same way at work. If you work in a call center, they can see. I used to work in a call center a million years ago. They could see your statistics. They can say, well, Phil only took two hours worth of calls during an eight hour shift. What was he doing the other six hours? So there is a shift in mindset and, and understanding that people, especially with schools being closed here in the States and a lot of countries as well, may not be able to work nine to five. So some companies have moved towards core hours. So I'd argue that it's a combination of tools and mindset. And I'd also throw in employees, right? If you need someone over your shoulder to motivate you, you may not wind up being very productive for your company because there is no one in your home. You're not letting your boss in. So it's a bunch of different things. One of the statistics I um, researched and quoted in Slack for Dummies is that something like 40% um, of American companies said working from home was important, but only five or 6% said they were ready for it. Well, guess what? Come March of 2020, we were thrust into the midst of the greatest work from home experiment ever. So there's a reason that uh, tools like Microsoft Teams blew up and, and Zoom went from 10 million primarily business users at the end of 2019 to 200 million primarily consumer users in March of 2020, and then 300 million in late April. So forced adoption is helping with the tools piece of it. And it's interesting, Zoom, uh, even though it took some heat for some privacy issues, which it has largely addressed, um, did not go down. So we're talking about you know, two, 3,000 percent growth in number of users and probably a, an even greater increase in the number of calls. Yet the tool itself never crashed, never went down. And that was a testament to its management's design decisions and the technology behind it. So no one's happy that we're living in a pandemic, but I'd argue from for, for some employees, not for most, if you work in a hospital, if you work at Amazon, if you work in a, in a restaurant or in uh, transportation or, or travel, you're in a different boat. But if you had to be in a pandemic and you're in the field of knowledge work, at least you have tools now that can simulate having a meeting in person or simulate having that conversation around a water cooler. But, but you're right, it isn't the same. So there's, as we, you know, let's say a company says, all right, we're going to use Zoom and Slack. Do they buy them all a copy of your book? Or is there a shorter guide? I mean, I believe very much in protocols. So let's have some communication protocols. And if you're new to, you know, remote work, you're not quite sure how to do that, when to set up a meeting, how to be able to do that, sure. well, how you use Slack. I have in my company's a little Slack induction guide, which is how we use it. And I think there's plenty of different ways you can use Slack. Sure. Zoom, Zoom may be a little more straightforward. So just to get going, do you need to set some communication protocols, some guides? I mean, what, how much 
Do you need to get people to be productive and to not be all going off in different directions using these kinds of tools uh, at the outset? Yeah, well, neither book is short. They both come in at around 400 pages. I think the Zoom book is exactly 400 pages. But there is no one right way to do it. Uh, just in the case of Zoom, the way that a Pilates studio would use it would be different than the way that a, a corporate environment might use it or the way that educational institutions would use it. And there are all sorts of logistical concerns. Um, I actually reached out to people from different companies in both books to say, hey, how do you use this? And a political um, action committee would use it in a different way than a much larger organization. In fact, by not putting some thought into it from the beginning, they wound up making some mistakes. So with respect to Slack, even though Zoom lets you have channels as well, you know, what's the right number of Slack channels, right? I, I don't know. It's probably more than one. It's probably fewer than a thousand. And you have to think about what you're trying to achieve. There was um, an example in the book, or I might've blogged about it. I forget which one the books kind of uh, combined for me or mixed together of uh, this company away that was using Slack really as a, a punitive tool and, and chastising people in it. And I thought that was really disturbing, but the tool, one of my favorite quotes is from um, Melvin Kranzberg, technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. So the tool won't take care of itself. You can still use it to act like an idiot, right? Or to make an inappropriate comment or to send a risque video, or you could use it in a way to demean other employees. So um, I do think there's an opportunity for, for training and consulting and at the very least by the book and the way the dummies books are written. Um, if one chapter doesn't really appeal to you, for example, if you don't use Zoom phone or Zoom rooms, then you can easily skip that chapter. But uh, trust me, these could be thousand page books. It, in a way, they're manifestations of how we communicate with each other. And I'm not smart enough to write a 400 page book that covers every scenario. You can't possibly have I know one of the best sellers now is Robert's set of rules. So I'm sort of battling that book with Zoom for one in one of the Amazon categories. But there's no way you can cover every conceivable scenario and the way that you'd act in different countries or in different cultures or different types of people or with different racial or ethnic or gender issues. Uh, there's no way you can codify every one of them. Yeah, yes. So, of course, Zoom has uh, various competitors or uh, companies with similar offerings, Slack. You know, there's a few others which are adjacent. And there's obviously plenty of alternatives to that kind of real-time communication. And I, I, I come from a world where we used to, where Yammer was new a long time ago. Oh, yeah, yeah. Microsoft <laughs> bought them for, I think it was $1.2 billion in, was it 2012? Because Microsoft has a genius for buying things and <laughs> reducing their value dramatically. Well, it's crazy with Microsoft because they've got Teams, they've got SharePoint, they've got regular Skype, they've got Skype for Business. Um, they still own um, Yammer, even though I think they're phasing that out. And they've they got Microsoft grew. Teams. Right. So Zoom is, is entirely focused on teleconferencing, even though they have these other parts of the book. Yeah. Uh, and that I mentioned in the book in Slack. I think they've got about 2,200 employees, but they're all focused on the eponymous pro product Slack. Whereas yeah. Microsoft's all over the place. I mean, I'm seeing in the news they may buy TikTok, right? They're, you know, they're they're doing everything. So, yeah, I, I make TikTok the argument. For business, the, maybe they'll have that soon. You know, if there are some people who dance for business, and I'll just leave that one there. But uh, yeah, it is interesting that those companies, Zoom and Slack, tend to be more focused. Whereas Microsoft, and they're a very successful company. I think their market cap is over a trillion dollars. Last time I checked. You know, they're focused on everything. So they tend not to be the most innovative. Um, whereas, you know, say with Slack shared, cha um, shared channels or private channels, they've had for a long time. Microsoft introduced private channels, I think only at the end of 2019. And I think they're working on shared channels. Whereas again, Zoom is, it's a little bit like um, FedEx. They tend to innovate quickly and UPS sees what FedEx does and goes, all right, they made those mistakes, so they're kind of a fast follower. Yeah, yeah. So, so I suppose my, my kind of question is, say, okay, we have video, we've got enterprise social. Is there anything else? Are there any other sorts of types of tools that are fundamental for, from this working from home uh, thing? Can you do it with Zoom and Slack? Or are there other things which are tools or yeah, pieces it, of that puzzle which are going to be valuable or invaluable? 
Right. So Slack doesn't try to do everything, Ross, as you know. In fact, I've listened to interviews with Stuart Butterfield, who's the CEO of Slack, and he says uh, for a 2200-person 22 22 company, uh, we use something like 560 different tools. And that seems like a lot, but if you think about Google Drive and all the tools there, or Microsoft Office, or Salesforce for CRM, or Workday if they use that for of paying their employees or ERP and, and cloud storage solutions. And they still use Zoom. And I'm just naming 10 or 12 tools here. So uh, you can't do everything in one of these tools. Um, Slack is trying to be the glue that puts all these things together. And if you think about the fact that there are more than 2,000 apps last time I checked, um, there are a lot of really cool ways to use Slack. For example, as a professor, I used to do polls with my students. Zoom isn't quite there yet when it comes to third-party apps, but they're going to be catching up. So if I wanted to set up an Outlook or a Gmail, a Google Calendar appointment, I can sync that with Zoom. So if I'm on the phone with you in Zoom, um, no one can book that time because it's going to read that if I put my calendar that's out there. So um, I don't think that there's one mega tool, but one of the tips that I give in the Zoom book is to pick a lane, right? If I only communicate with you in Slack, that's great. I know where to go. But if I sometimes communicate with you in Zoom and sometimes it's text and sometimes it's email and sometimes it's Microsoft Teams and I'm going to, where is that one key document which is going to drive people crazy? In fact, in my opinion, that's one of the reasons that many people have resisted using Slack and to a lesser extent Zoom. They're just used to email. Even though it isn't terribly efficient, they don't have to learn a new language, so to speak. So Hopefully they'll realize when they see it's a dummies book that it's not that hard. If I can do it, anybody can. And these tools require zero programming. You don't need to know how to code. You just need to open your mind. And if you want to use Zoom for just meetings, that's fine, but you can do so much more. Yes, absolutely. So when I, we, I was interviewing our mutual friend, Terry Griffith, <clears throat> on the uh, Virtual Excellence Show, we were talking about virtual organizations, you know, your classics, your automatic tel top towel, um, yeah, you know, GitLab and so on. And so, but what we are moving now is the virtualized organizations. You know, they're not, they haven't come from being completely virtual. They may not, they probably won't ever get to be completely virtual, but they are being virtualized at the moment. So pulling up from sort of the tools thing to this sort of more macro around, I suppose, the leadership or management frame, what are the, what are the things that leaders need to be keeping in mind as they shift to, to more virtualized organizations than they've had before? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Now, there's a downside to that because even if we are communicating in a virtual way, we're still losing something with them. Um, facial expressions and body language. I'm sure you've heard the phrase Zoom fatigue, but plenty of companies, I know Facebook's one of them, had historically wanted everyone in the office. Um, Tony Zappa, Tony Shea from Zappos to Marissa Meyer when she was with uh, Yahoo. Even IBM walked back letting employees work remotely. Well, now we have no choice. And to the extent that people can still be productive, it makes me think quite a bit about leadership and the future of work. In the future, will you need to be in an office nine to five, Monday through Friday, you know, maybe, maybe not. Do you need to live near the office? Maybe, maybe not. I can envision people living three or four hours away from the office and driving in once or twice a month for a meeting or to say hi. Um, if you, I'm working on coding by myself, do I need to be in an office or much less an open office where people are quite frankly distracting me? The research on open offices has been quite negative um, and companies like to promote its benefits, but it tends to distract workers. They tend not to have a great deal of privacy. Now, if we're brainstorming, can we do that as well on a Zoom call? You know, probably not. Um, so if I'm interviewing someone, yeah, Slack has hired people without ever meeting them. And maybe that will become more common in the future. But I, I think the future of work and uh, leadership, Ross, will be very much of a hybrid nature. Right. So you are, amongst other things, a speaker. And so I presume you haven't been doing any in-person events lately, but uh, perhaps you've been doing some uh, no, I, I, so I happen to think the virus is real, uh, is real and the people who have showed up at uh, political events in Oklahoma without wearing masks uh, have right. come down with the virus and 
So I'm going to err on the side of caution for the foreseeable future. Yes, there are plenty of cautionary tales out there. Uh, so so I'm, I'm a keynote speaker as well. And so part of what I've been doing is to shifting into virtual speaking. And so I just wondered if you have any tips, advice, ideas, thoughts, perspectives on uh, that virtual speaker role, which is, you know, it's not very natural sitting in front of a camera uh, and presenting to a bunch of people who are God knows where. So what, what, are, you, what, are, what, what are your perspectives on that? I mean, hopefully it's temporary. Um, comedians, musicians, and I've got, I'm not the funniest guy in the world, but I have my moments. I've got zero musical skill. True entertainers, actors, people doing plays will tell you that they feed off the energy from the audience. And I can't imagine that that will ever go away. We certainly want to connect, especially after being locked down for so long. However, it's silly to think that there won't be advances in software. We were speaking before about mm -hmm, the app that seems to show a lot of promise and not just having someone speaking in front of a standard PowerPoint deck. Certainly the tool that you're using here OBS is impressive and you know it far better than I do. Um, I was doing a webinar last week and there were about 50 people on the call and I could see their names so I could actually call them, much like I would if I were doing a smaller conference. But I would never call on someone necessarily speaking in front of four or 500 people. Now, if they were taking questions, if I were taking questions, someone could ask me a question and I could answer it. So it simulates it a bit, but we might be able to do better with this format. But Again, call me old school, but I can't imagine not being able to see one of my favorite bands or one of my favorite comedians and shake someone's hand. So I, I don't think that this is uh, the public speaking will take a dip, obviously, with the economy right now. And hopefully it will come back and people will think about better ways. And I know there are companies that are fiddling with different ways of doing it. And I never want to say never, because if you told me, 25 years ago that we'd be able to have a concurrent conference call with very little latency the way we do with Zoom, I'd say, how exactly does that happen? But yeah, I I know that Airbnb is experimenting with virtual experiences and I heard they're not too bad, but you know, I, I, I've never been to the Australian Open. I'm a big tennis fan. I, I can't imagine the same, you know, now that the NBA has returned, they have uh, this sort of virtual reality type thing with fans, it's not the same as screaming at a referee or cheering when your favorite player makes a shot if you're sitting at your house by yourself. Yes, yes, no, it's not the same, but I guess part of it is we're going to be pushing a little bit further to see what it is we can do when we're not physically in the same place. Now, that's, that's kind of the interesting piece. So if I'm not mistaken, the um, same word in Chinese for opportunity means crisis. So yes, this is a crisis right now, but that's arguably an opportunity. And that's why that um, company behind the mm -hmm app, All Turtles, essentially um, put that app at the forefront because they realized that there was a significant opportunity here, uh, which makes the rise of Zoom even more interesting to me because I think Skype at one point had 650 million users. Why didn't everybody move to Skype? I don't know. That's a fascinating discussion for me. Everyone went to Zoom and I have my theories, but... So no one, uh, Yogi Berra, the former baseball player and manager of the New York Yankees famously said, predictions are difficult, especially about the future. It's one of my favorite quotes. So, uh, which I suppose means I shouldn't be asking you for any predictions. But what I, what I will ask you. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 again, it's, it's fun to make them. And in fact, I, I've actually noticed that with Slack and Zoom and some of the announcement that they've made since I've written the book, I've actually been right. Now, to be fair, I spent a lot of time writing those books and researching them, and it's not like I'm making predictions on who's going to win Australian rules football because I don't know what I'm talking about there. But, um, you know, I, I do think that Slack and Zoom will continue to evolve. And specifically, what we'll see more with regard to machine learning, artificial intelligence, voice, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality. Uh, I have it on good authority that some changes are, are coming in those regards. Um, I also think with regard to Slack that it has the potential to be transformative in the following way. So Slack is what they call a backronym. That's sort of a contrived acronym right? um, for searchable log of all communication and knowledge. Right? Well, if we move away from email and have all of our discussions in Slack, then Slack through artificial intelligence and machine learning can learn a great deal about 
how we work. And this isn't a matter of searching for something, hey, where is that Microsoft Word file or what was the decision on X made two weeks ago? Again, in an interview with Stuart Butterfield, he envisioned Slack in the future as an always on chief of staff that answers questions you didn't think to ask. And when I heard that interview, it sort of blew my mind. And you think about using Zoom in the same kind of way. I mean, imagine if we had our calls in Zoom and we sent text messages to each other in Zoom. And Zoom could make recommendations. Hey, you know, we haven't heard from Ross lately. Is he okay? Is he not feeling engaged as an employee? Is he looking at other places? Is he not a good performer? So I really believe that we are in the first inning of these collaboration tools and the coronavirus for all of the hazards that it's brought in the people who've unnecessarily died and suffered. We might look back at this as this transformative event in work. So there's almost pre-COVID and post-COVID because we all had to use these tools. And I don't think that we're going to go back to using email. I mean, email doesn't die, right? Because you connected with me over email, we exchanged a few. Trust me, if we were working together on a six-month project, I would bring you over to Slack or Zoom. There's no way we'd exchange emails back and forth. It's just, there's a different formality. And even with something like an emoji, it's, it's really interesting. So one of the Slack emojis has the eyes looking towards the right, I believe. Right? So you're looking into it. So just that communication, right? I'll look into it or I'll take a look at it, I think is absolutely fascinating. Imagine sending someone an email. I'll look into it. Right? It's almost like that nonverbal communication. I know people who hate receiving that email. Okay. Whereas with Slack, with an emoji, and you could do this in Zoom too, thumbs up is completely acceptable. So I used to be five, six years ago, anti-emoji. I thought it was a bit unprofessional. Now I look at it as an essential piece of it because I don't have to type out good idea. I just pick a creative one and also make it more fun, more casual. There's a formality to email. Marshall McLuhan famously said the medium is the message, right? If I send you an email, carbon copying someone, it has this tone of formality, right? It's a, it's a documented statement. Whereas in Slack, it tends to be a little bit less formal and you can put in an animated GIF. And yes, I say GIF, not GIF. So it, work doesn't have to suck. And, you know, again, you can overdo it with these tools. And, and one of the final tips I give in the Slack book is to turn Slack off because you don't want your phone blowing up all the time, basically having an electronic leash. So I'm really encouraged about all these different tools and how they can make work, quite frankly, suck less. And especially if you think about the notification features of both Slack and Zoom, again, email, yeah, you can set up different rules and tags and folders and all that. But if you think about it, it's basically a binary, right? You're in email or you're not. It's running or it's not. Whereas with Slack and Zoom, I can say, I want to hear from Ross or I want to mute Phil or I only want to hear from people in this channel. Or, I only want to hear on my computer. I don't want to hear on my phone or I'm going to close the app so I can't hear on my phone. So there are all these ways to making our notifications much more personal to us. You can mute an entire channel. Maybe I only want to check in on a channel once a week. Maybe there's some other channels I want to check in five times a day because it's essential to my job as an IT support rep. So I'm really excited about the power of these tools. Yeah, no, that's, that's fantastic. I mean, you're opening my mind to some of those possibilities. And I, one, the, one thing I think you know, I also found inspiring from what you said is this idea of the Slack as the chief operating, chief of staff, whatever. And if you think about, you know, if you, lay, if you use... AI and machine learning well, then yeah, that sort of thing is possible. And obviously then you start to obviously auto transcribe, you know, tag, tag videos, capture, you know, build it into knowledge base. So oh, that's, that's, that is, uh, you know, it does point to something which is way beyond what we have today. Yeah, one of my pet peeves is when people call Slack email 2.0. Um, and, I, and I draw a parallel between that and the joke that one of my favorite comedians, Gary Goldman, made or, um, jokes. He says that if you, um, it's like calling a, um, okay, the joke is calling a phone a phone is like calling a Lexus convertible a cup holder. It'll do that, but it'll do a few more things. Yeah, 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 Absolutely. And yeah, no, that, that's, that's, I think that's, that's insightful in the sense of, yeah, people are using Slack, uh, Slack in particular, as well as Zoom, obviously can be so much more than they 
are being used. And as you, as you say, yeah, the, I, I, uh, I think it's pretty clear. Yes, we have a pre-COVID and a post-COVID work state and we are learning so fast with the help of people like you uh, in order to be able to how to do that well. Yeah, and let's not forget that these companies, I'll put it politely, borrow from each other, right? Microsoft is looking at what Slack's doing. Don't tell me that Zoom isn't looking at what Slack and Microsoft are doing and vice versa. So ultimately the consumer or the worker benefits. As I said, there are channels in Zoom. A lot of people don't use them, but I can mute people or channels in Zoom. I can set a status update in Zoom, all of which I can do in Slack. Now, there are going to be differences between the two Right? I really don't believe that Slack is trying to compete with Zoom for the powerful video conferencing or doing webinars. As I said before, there's a Slack app for Zoom and a Zoom app for Slack. There's actually a Slack app for Microsoft Teams. So they're trying to do this whole notion of frenemies, which is a, a notion I discuss in my book, The Age of the Platform. You're not trying to lock people necessarily into only one tool, much less with a multi-year contract. You know, Slack is by the month. Zoom is by the month if you want. There are free versions of these tools. So there's never been a better time, I would argue. You don't have to make those types of decisions. Now, again, you probably want to pick a primary lane because if you and I communicate in six different mediums, we're going to drive each other crazy. But there, there will be organizations, let's say that you're working with a marketing agency and they use Slack and you use Microsoft Teams, right? Or you have people in the organization that rely upon email. Well, in Gmail, and I'm sure in Microsoft Outlook, you can install an app that immediately transfers a conversation from email into Slack, which I would argue is where it should probably wind up taking place. So these are just some of the issues I get into in the books. That's why they're not short books. Yeah, yeah, plenty to learn. And uh, that's exactly what we're trying to do on the, the Virtual Excellence Show by getting insights from people like you who have gone uh, done their homework. So thank you so much, uh, Phil. It's been uh, really insightful. It's some really pragmatic uh, insights as well as some bigger perspectives on uh, what's happening. So any references where, where should people go to find out about you and your work and your books? Yeah, philsimon.com. You can find out all about my madness. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Phil, and have a glorious day. Cheers. So we've uh, learned all about Zoom and Slack and uh, virtual organizations from the esteemed uh, Phil Simon. So please do like the video if you liked it. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, go to our website, thevx.show. We have a hashtag, hashvxshow on Twitter. Our Facebook group if you want to build some bigger conversations. And if you want to watch our episodes uh, live, they're at the same time every week. So thank you for being with us once again. Stay tuned for more on virtual excellence. Thanks.